The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon. I'm Professor John Jackson, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to the 13th Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I will turn over to uh, Admiral Chatfield, our president, to have her welcoming remarks. Admiral? Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Um, in your company and to share this time with you. Uh, this is a wonderful series that we have that allows us to share our uh, rich academic uh, lectures uh, in a broader audience. And I want to extend among all of our uh, listeners today, uh, you know, we are always grateful for the participation of members of the community, our spouses network, uh, our Naval War College Foundation members, but today we're joined by the Rhode Island National Guard Joint Diversity Council. And it really is an honor to welcome you into this space. And I wanna thank you for expressing your interest and being here present with us for, the, for an important lecture. And so uh, we'll sit back and we'll, um, oh, and here's my husband, David, who's uh, joining. And uh, we would just love to uh, welcome you to this event today. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral David. Uh, this series was originally established as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the nation. We will be offering five additional lectures between now and May of 2021. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. Looking ahead on Tuesday, 23 March, 2021, we will hear from Professor Jessica Blankshane and Professor Lindsey Cohn, who will speak about civil military relations. Today, a family discussion group meeting will follow the formal lecture in order to provide information to the community on specific programs and services available here in Newport. Our special guest for this week is Fran Sokol from the Fleet and Family Support Center, who will talk about the Spousal Hiring Assistance Program. So that'll be coming after the formal presentation and the questions and answers. Okay, let's move on to the main event. During the presentation that follows, please feel free to ask questions using the chat function of Zoom, and we will get to them at the conclusion of the presentation. Discussions about racial and gender inequities are now a common part of our public discourse, and addressing such inequities are very much on the agenda of the leaders of the military services. Today's presentation will give us a chance to reflect and engage these issues as our students do in the College of Leadership and Ethics. Our speaker will help us consider the issues from the standpoint of ethics and leadership as informed by both academic insights and practical perspectives. Professor Pauline Shanks Curran holds a PhD in philosophy from Temple University, specializing in military ethics, just war theory and applied ethics. She serves as the Stockdale Chair of, and Professor of Military Ethics here at the Naval War College. She holds a BA degree in Philosophy and International Relations from Concordia College in Minnesota and an MA degree in Philosophy from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. Her most recent book is the widely praised On Obedience, Contrasting Philosophies for Military, Citizenry, and Community which was published by the U.S. Naval Institute in 2020. Her work has been published in Newsweek, War on the Rocks, U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings, and a variety of academic journals. I'm pleased to pass the digital baton 
to Dr. Pauline Shanks Corin. Thank you, John, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm, so, I'm a little surprised there's so many of you here because at least in Rhode Island, it is a lovely, lovely sunny day. Uh, the kind of day uh, when one might ask if we can have class outside. Um, so, but thank you for coming. Um, I will be, we're, we're in my dining room. Um, and uh, we're just, we're gonna have a discussion about race and gender through the lens of, of, of my discipline of philosophy and ethics, and also through the lens of some of the practical things that we do um, in the College of Leadership and Ethics. So towards the end, there will be a practical exercise. So if you have a pad and paper, you will be needing that later. Uh, you won't have to share, um, but I am gonna ask you to write some things down and to do some reflective processing. Um, so first of all, um, kudos to you for being willing to enter this space. I know these are challenging conversations uh, for many of us. And so I wanna give you credit for at least being willing to enter the space uh, and listen and engage on this topic. Um, that's the often the biggest hurdle. Um, uh, the introduction laid out who I am, I'm a philosophy professor. And I come to this topic um, both personally and professionally. Personally, I am the mother of two children of color. Um, uh, one of my sons is uh, Latino of Mexican descent. And my other son is um, African-American and Asian. Um, and so I came to, I'm an adoptive mother. And so I came to have to think about a lot of these kinds of issues because this is what is in my household. And so um, this summer was, <clears throat> as we say in my family, festive, uh, thinking about George Floyd, especially since my African-American son was really, so he's 13 now, so he's old enough to understand that. But I also came to thinking about questions of race through, through ethics, through philosophy of law, um, and through social and political philosophy. When I taught undergraduate uh, philosophy, I taught a course in philosophy and race. Um, and also taught a significant portion of a course on philosophy of law in critical legal theory, which is the source or one of the sources for the critical race tradition. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation, but occasionally I'm gonna share screens. So I'm hoping that won't be too clunky. Um, so you'll just have to forgive me a little bit of, of grace with the back and forth on that. But I wanted this to be a, a conversation. So this is not going to be a lecture about the empirical facts of issues of race and gender inequity in this country. Um, there is a wide, wide and very deep body of literature establishing historical uh, and structural inequities um, in it, with different racial groups and different gender groups. Uh, that is the domain of the social sciences. I have many wonderful colleagues here at the Navy War College who, who do social science work. It would be unethical of me to pretend uh, that I do that kind of work. So I am not going to engage in that. If that's why you're here, I apologize. Um, that's not what this conversation is going to be about. So this is going to be a conversation about, about race um, and gender through the lens of ethics and leader development. And it is really important at this point that I acknowledge something in, in my discipline um, that's called positionality. I need to own my position. I am a white woman. Uh, so I may have some authority to speak about gender. My authority to speak about race is complicated. Um, I'm not going to purport to represent any other racial perspective, except as I understand it through my scholarly lens or through my personal experiences with my children. I also wanna honor that I'm in my dining room. The land I sit on is native land. The land I was born on in Cheyenne, Wyoming is native land. The land I grew up in, in great, near Great Falls, Montana is native land. Um, my son, one of my sons is descended from enslaved persons. My other son, uh, is, his, his family is from Mexico and he was born in California, which was 
part of Mexico. So all of these are part of the identity uh, that I hold and the way in which I have to approach this topic, which is with some empathy, but also a great deal of humility. Right? So I'm not here to preach. Um, because a narrative approach is part of the methodology we use, I may tell stories about my children. Um, I have asked permission to do so. I don't show pictures of my children because they're teenagers and they have elected that I'm no longer allowed to do that, which is completely and utterly fair. Um, but I want you to know anything I say about my children, I have asked them if I can, if I can share. So I'm more of a guide on a journey. Um, and maybe I've been on the, um, the journey perhaps a little longer in different ways than other people have, um, but I'm merely a guide. I'm not here to preach. We're here to have a conversation and to really ask the question, how do we have conversations about these very difficult issues? And I will just say that I do have a quote from uh, the Duchess of Sussex for later, if you've been watching CNN um, or anything on TV the last couple of days, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you don't, you should check that out. Okay, so what are we gonna do today? Um, I'm gonna try to not talk too long so we can have lots of time for conversation. Um, first of all, number one, we need to leave moral judgment at the door, which as an ethicist really hard for me because I love moral judgment. It's so awesome, especially when I get to judge other people because it makes me feel so much better. But we're gonna need to bracket, we need to leave our moral judgment at the door. So I want you to think about wherever you are and notice where you are. I practice yoga, so my yoga instructor who is um, Adrian from Yoga with Adrian with the dog um, says often to notice where you are, but not to judge it, right? You just, you come as you are. Also, we wanna leave our baggage at the door. Our assumptions, our biases, our experiences, we all have them. They're there, but I, wanted, I want you to try to bracket them. And the analogy I use with my students is that we're gonna try on some shoes. Um, behind me is one of three shoe closets that I have in my house. Um, and it has been observed that I have a little bit of a shoe problem. Um, I like to think of it as a hobby, but other people uh, tell me that it's a, it's a problem. We're gonna try on shoes. Uh, you gotta, I want you to put them on. I want you to walk around. I want you to look at them in the mirror. Think about how they go with your outfits. Do you like them? Do you not like them? But I really want you to feel them. Um, even if you're trying, the shoes you're trying on are wedges, which I typically do not like. Um, but I'm going to try them on anyway, because maybe this is the pair that I'm going to like. Um, and even if it isn't, it's important for me to have that experience of walking around in them. At the end of the day, you can take them off. I'm not taking your own shoes away. I'm not asking you to sell your shoes, right? I'm not saying you have to take these shoes, but we want to have that experience of walking around and really trying them on. So try to leave your baggage, leave your shoes aside for a moment. You get them back. Um, but for now in this space, let's try on some shoes. Um, we need to get clarity on what the issues are and what they aren't and try to clear out some misperceptions. Um, and then we're also going to do an exercise to practice some modes of engagement, just as we would in the class, so that we can reflect on our experiences. Reflection is an important part of what philosophers do. It's also an important part of what we do in our leadership practice in the College of Leadership and Ethics. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to share a screen. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, one never knows about these things. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see a slide that says you may have heard. You may have heard of these terms. And once again, notice the terms without judgment. You might think these are PC terms. You might think they're woke. Um, you might think all kinds of things about them, but forget how you are judging them and just notice these terms. These are terms related to the topics of race and gender inequity um, in this country and, and in other places. Um, and some of these may seem buzzwordy, 
and they are subject to misuse quite a bit. As a philosopher, I care about definitions and using words properly. And they all have specific definitions within academic discourse and within, within academic literature and a specific context, whether it's in philosophy and law or so on. Now, don't worry, I am not going to define all of these for you. Okay. So that's our first of four slides, if you want to keep track, if that helps you sort of keep awake. Um, so what is the issue? What is it that all of those terms on the slide sort of point to? The issue is systemic and cult or structural um, disadvantages in racial and gender categories. These structural and systemic um, disadvantages are also intentional and they're historical. One does not accidentally enslave millions of people. That's not an accident, that's intentional. Like you have to set out to do that. Um, so these are systemic and structural disadvantages um, on, in terms of racial and gender categories that are imposed by one group and disadvantage other groups, right? So I'm going to, yes, thank you for the spelling. My spell check can never get privileged, so it's always spelled wrong. And so I completely own that. Thank you for the correction. I have two analogies for you to think about because the, the systemic structural piece I think is hard for American audiences to wrap our brains around because we're informed by a political, uh, a tradition called political liberalism. And political liberalism is the view um, rooted in John Locke and John Stuart Mill, who are both Enlightenment philosophers, uh, that the individual is the basic unit of society, um, that the political rights and moral responsibility are to be understood in terms of the individual. And it's the job of the state to protect basic rights, and including property, um, to secure those rights, but to be neutral on all questions of value. And that is the, that whether you are politically liberal or politically conservative, um, that, that is a shared American tradition of how we think about, um, how we think about politics. So I'm gonna give you two analogies to sort of help you think about the systemic nature of racial and gender inequities. The first is uh, free Wi-Fi. Raise your hand if you'd like free Wi-Fi. Does that sound like a good deal? It's a good deal, right? So let's imagine that you get free Wi-Fi. You're not really sure how. One day you're out talking to your neighbor um, and you're blonde and, and he's blonde and you're like, do you get free Wi-Fi? And he's like, yeah, I get free Wi-Fi. Do you know why we get free Wi-Fi? I have no idea. A few days later, you're out talking to your neighbor who's a redhead and you're like, dude, do you get free Wi-Fi? No, I don't get free Wi-Fi. Well, how much do you have to pay for Wi-Fi? Well, I have to actually pay twice the going rate. So not only do I have to pay for it, I have to pay twice what everyone else has to pay. All right, so this is an example as a privilege. I'm getting free Wi-Fi. I didn't ask for it. If I could figure out how to give it back as a good ethics professor, I might do that, but I don't know how to do that. Um, but I'm getting a benefit at the expense of my redheaded neighbor who not only has to pay for it, but he has to pay twice as much. So that's one way to think about um, these kinds of things. Another way to think about it is the dinner party. I love dinner parties. COVID has been really hard on me because I can't have dinner parties because I love to cook and I love to have people over uh, who are not my teenage sons to eat my food and tell me how wonderful it is, right? Because they just want to have dominoes all the time. So I'm having a dinner party and I buy a bunch of people and, and the Admiral comes to the dinner party and she looks around and she says, um, did you notice that the only people here are blondes? And I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that. Oh, gee, I must have left the redheads off the, off the guest list. And she says, oh, don't you think she should invite some redheads? I'm like, yeah, okay, I should invite some redheads. So the typical image of, of how you deal with, with racial and gender inequities is just some people got left off the, the guest list, right? It's a matter of inviting the people um, who, who were not invited. But what if it turns out that the problem isn't the guest list? 
problem is the dinner party itself, how the notion of a dinner party is constructed, and then who ought to be invited to a dinner party. So even if you invite these other people to the dinner party, we haven't really questioned the basic assumption of the dinner party. And we might ask, why, why are we having a dinner party? I mean, wouldn't it be better to have a barbecue or a potluck or, or some other kind of social event, right? So those are two sort of images to help us wrestle with sort of the nature, the, the systemic and structural nature of these inequities. It's not the case that African-Americans were just left off the guest list. And then we can just fix it by adding them to the guest list. That doesn't, if there are structural inequities, that does nothing to address those structural inequities, right? And the same uh, with Wi-Fi. So this is not a case of a few bad apples. This is, as the Duchess of Sussex said, she said, racism, racist is not rude. They're different things. That's a paraphrase. I don't have her exact quote, right? This is not a matter of, of people who are being mean or rude or ignorant individuals. We tend to think of racism or sexism as this is a problem with individuals. It's not a problem with individuals only. Right? It's a problem with, of individuals within a structure, within a society, within a system. It's also not generational. I've taught undergraduates for 25 years. Um, and it's not as simple as saying, well, that was okay back in the day, back when my grandparents were alive, and it's not okay now. So we're less racist than they were back then. It's not, that's not clear empirically or in any other way, especially narratively, right? Um, and it's also not the case that this is accidental, right? It wasn't, it wasn't an accident that certain members of certain racial categories or certain gender categories were um, excluded or put at a systemic disadvantage. I mean, you have to really be a, a robust conspiracy theorist to, to think that it just, it, it, we just all decided to enslave you know, African Americans at the same time. We all decided women should own property at the same time, right? These are structural things. This is also not a matter of oversensitivity or hurt feelings. That's not what this is about. This is about systems and structures that disadvantage some people and advantage other people. But remember, moral judgment at the door. At this point, we're not saying, whether this is good, whether this is bad, whether you should feel bad, whether you should feel good, whether you're a bad person or a good person, that's not the conversation. This is a conversation about systemic and structural disadvantages, right? That have a history and that are intentional and in some ways are rooted in this tradition of political liberalism where we focus on the individual, right? Which then, is very nice because it gets us out of having these conversations about systems. So if we were all in the room together, many of us would be dressed in a similar fashion. And I'm not talking about a military uniform. I'm talking about just fashion, right? Or if we walked out to the parking lot and looked at everybody's cars, there's a lot of similar kinds of cars. Is that an accident? We all just happened to pick the same kind of car? No, we didn't. You're subject to advertisement, right? In your entire life, you've been pitched at about you need to have this kind of house, you need to have this kind of car, you need to have this kind of thing. And I know we all like to think that we're all radical individualists and we all make up our own minds, but we swim in this soup. It's this, and it influences us. And that's not to judge us, right? It would be really weird if we grew up in this society and we weren't influenced by these constant messages. And racism and sexism are the same way. They're the soup that we swim in. Okay, so time to share screen again. This is slide number two. So we've seen number one. This is number two. So these are some things, I won't read them, that I hear a lot. And you probably recognize some of these. And maybe you've said some of these. So just take a moment to... Take these in for a moment. And think about what do these comments reveal to you? No judgment, not whether they're right or wrong or good or bad, or if these are horrible people who said these things to you. 
But what do these reveal? What do these comments reveal to you? Just, just take a moment to kind of sit with it. Some things that we might see are fear, discomfort, marginalization, externalizing a problem, it's someone else's problem. And I want you to think about if these, if any of these comments resonate for you and they reveal feelings of fear, discomfort, marginalization, I want you to think about that those feelings would also apply if you are a member of a marginalized community hearing these words, right? That to my son, you will, he will feel discomfort at being um, profiled when he walks to the dollar store every single time, right? That he will feel discomfort, that he will feel marginalization. So one of the things we do in, in, in thinking about leadership is try to flip the script, try to imagine something from someone else's point of view. Okay. That's our second. So we're halfway through. Slides anyway. Um, so how do we approach this through a leadership and ethics lens? Um, in leadership and ethics, we, uh, we focus on four things that I'm gonna talk briefly about. Um, first of all, it's perspective taking, which is trying to enter into the experience, uh, at least mentally, from someone else's perspective, literally to take someone else's perspective. Without judgment, just, just take their perspective. Uh, we also try to articulate someone else's views from their point of view to say, I might say to my friend, Michael, um, this is what I heard you say. Is this what, is this, did I get that right? We call that in psychology, they call it mirroring, um, often use it in marriage counseling, right? Very useful with your partners if you want to use that. So articulating someone else's views, which can involve empathy. You have to understand someone else's view from their point of view. We also reflect on and, and do critical analysis of our own views uh, and experiences. So now I need to step back and say, what does this say about my own position? And then how can I use what I've learned as an ethical, but not just a moral leader? A moral leader is someone who knows what's right and wrong. An ethical leader can reflect on and articulate and think about what's right and wrong and convey that to someone else. So what do we do in leadership and ethics? Well, part of what we do, we might use narrative. Um, and narrative is very common in, in, in discussions about race and gender as a way to capture lived experience that the majority doesn't have, right? Um, so if there's time in the discussion and you want to hear my story about buying a hair product for my African-American son, we can talk about that. It's a story I use to illustrate my own uh, white female privilege. We also use empathy which is entering into someone else's experience, both cognitively and emotionally from their point of view, trying to understand what it feels like for them. Not judging it, that doesn't mean we agree with it. I can, enter, I can be empathetic with, uh, with someone who's a Nazi or a neo-Nazi. That doesn't mean I agree with their point of view. It means I can try to, to enter into it from their point of view, right? Um, we also interrogate our own experiences, especially our emotional reactions, which you're going to get to do in just a few minutes. Very often, we don't pay attention to our emotional life. Um, and I know in the military, very often you're told, I was raised by a senior NCO, I was, you know, was told, um, you know, you, you keep emotions out of things, like it's some contaminant that you have to be pure from, right? That's a deeply, philosophically, that's a deeply problematic view. So we have to interrogate our own experiences, including our own emotions. And then we also have to do some critical thinking around the sources of our own ideas, our commitments, our beliefs. Uh, you did not have those ideas, beliefs, commitments beamed into your head by aliens. At least I don't think so. They, they, they came from somewhere. They came from a long process. It's worth thinking about what that process is and trying to uncover that. So those are some of the tools that we might use in order to, to, to think about these kinds of questions. Okay, 
So it is now time for a very short exercise and I'm going to show you a slide. Um, and then I want you to work through each of these four points. It's gonna take about five minutes. Um, if you're in the room with someone else and you want to talk for the extroverts among us, that's fine. Um, if you're an introvert and just don't really like talking to other people, um, has COVID been awesome or what? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share a slide. So, and we're gonna walk through this together. <clears throat> okay, so I want you to note right now, this second, without judging, one or two emotional reactions you are having. Just one or two words, just jot those down. Don't judge it, just like, how are you feeling emotionally? Apathetic, angry, irritated, whatever it is. What's your emotional reaction? Now, I want you to pick one of those. And for that emotional reaction, ask yourself, what is the belief, the idea, the experience, the commitment or the value that's producing this reaction? In other words, where is this reaction coming from? It's not coming from out there. It's not because Professor Shanks Grin said something that irritated me, right? Um, there's something in you. There's some friction, as Clausewitz would say, because we can't have a talk at the War College without mentioning either Clausewitz or, or Mahan, and I can't do Mahan, I'm sorry. Um, what's the friction, right? Again, you're not judging this. What is it that's producing this uh, reaction, let's say, of irritation? What is it? What, what belief, idea, experience, commitment that you have that's rubbing here? Okay. Then for maybe pick one or two of those things that you isolated in B and ask yourself, where did those come from? What's the source of that? <laughs> the source of that belief, commitment, or value? Is it maybe your upbringing, your religious perspective, your, some experience you had, um, a book that you read, the Navy core values, whatever. But what's the source of this belief? Where did it come from? Okay, now is the fun part. We're on to D, now you get to judge and analyze. So now you can judge, analyze and critique what's in C. Is this something I need to reassess? <coughs> Do I need to reevaluate this belief, idea, commitment, whatever? Or does this process just help me understand why I react the way I do or why I think the way I do? Um, and how might that, the answer in D, how might that impact my ethical life or my role as a leader? Right, so D is where the, the judging comes in. Okay, so I call this a motive analysis. I've done this for years with undergraduate students in classes on, on war um, and also on classes about race and gender because these are, um, these are all issues that create emotional reactions. So I always end up teaching all the hot topic um, topics. I'm not sure why that is. Um, although I'm sure my mother can tell you why that is. Um, but these are, these are things that, that produce churn, right? So this process is something that, that is a good way to sort of analyze, to name and analyze your emotions and your emotional reactions to things. I went through this process this summer um, <clears throat> when my son uh, said that um, in response to me asking him to do chores, uh, that I was making him feel like a slave. Um, and you can imagine that I probably did not have the best reaction to this. This was about the time of George Floyd. Um, and of course, flew off the handle in a way that I should not have. Right. But then later had to go back and ask myself, OK, why did I have that reaction? 
right? What was producing that reaction? And what did I need to think about in terms of both race and gender um, and my relationship with my son to understand why that reaction happened? Because I heard the same thing from my oldest son probably a few years before and it hadn't had the same reaction. Okay, um, coming out of share for a moment. So we just did an exercise like you would do in one of our ethics and leadership classes. And then we would, in, in seminar, we would talk about it and talk about our takeaways and what we learned and, and how this might influence our leadership. We might also go off and do our own journaling, our own reflection or in a paper about, about this process, right? Um, so, so what next, right? And then I'm gonna stop so that we can have some conversation. Where are we going, what next? Uh, what's important about these discussions is to recognize there is individual agency. I'm not arguing there's no individual responsibility. That would be really weird for the Stockdale chair in ethics to be arguing that. <clears throat> not arguing that. What I am arguing is that we need to understand our individual agency within a collective context and that we also have collective agency. We do things in collaboration with other people. Right, so we are not only individual agents. And I hope that that line of argument is persuasive with people who are in the military because you all engage in collective agency all the time, right? Um, you can't wage a war without collective agency. But there is this collective context that we operate in. Um, and so another celebrity I wanna quote at this point is Will Smith who says, who makes a point about the difference between guilt and responsibility. It might not be your fault, but it may be your responsibility. I did not personally enslave African-Americans. I'm not sure that any of my ancestors did. They may have, they may not have. But the state of racism in our country and in my household is in fact my responsibility, even if I don't bear guilt for it. Right? We think of guilt as aligned with blame and causal agency, but we might still be responsible for things. I'm responsible to take care of the environment, even if I didn't dump the trash. So I think it's worth thinking about that. The last thing I'd like us to think about, and this is the last slide, and so far the technology has worked. Thank you, technology is that legacies of pain, suffering, and exploitation have daily implications. These are not abstract <laughs> academic issues that we only might only talk about in the university. These are things that have daily legacies. Right now, the vaccination rates for um, communities of color is much lower than for white communities, and the incidence and severity of COVID is much higher. The reason for that is historic inequities in the medical system and the way in which the medical system used members of, of communities of color as guinea as medical guinea pigs, right? That's something that, that is reverberating to this day right this second. Um, so I want to, we need, so there's kind of four points here that you can take a look at to, to think about. And I wanna, I wanna think about it, and this might sound a little Paula Annie-ish, like, you know, she's chipper and blonde and, and cheerful and perky. And my colleagues who work with me know that that's completely not me at all. Um, but I want us to think about how we can build meaningful communities and, and have meaningful engagements. I had a class in the winter term where we talked about many of these issues in a virtual classroom on discussion boards. And the students had really deep, respectful discussions. And we had a class that was, especially for the War College, was quite demographically diverse, at least in terms of racial issues. Um, but they were able to engage these issues even though they didn't agree. So we don't have to agree, but we do have to find some way to, to orient around shared projects or commitments. And we should also think about what are we missing? What, what is American society missing because some people um, are paying twice as much for Wi-Fi or are not at the dinner table or at the dinner party 
or what are we missing because we should be having a good Midwestern potluck instead of a fancy schmancy dinner party where we all have to dress up and I have to cook six courses. So what's being minimized? What are we missing? What's being left out? What can we have in terms of progress, in terms of um, collective enterprises, in terms of security, especially national security that we don't have because some people are, are disadvantaged at the expense of other people. And then what can we learn? Is there an opportunity here to learn something? Um, and I think there is. Um, and I think about when I decided to start to teach philosophy of race and when I embarked on the journey to adopt children, this talk today is not where I thought I would be. Um, but I've learned a lot. And a lot of times it's been really, really, really painful, um, that journey. But what could we learn and how could we grow um, and how could our shared lives be better um, by what we learn? Right? I think I'm, a, I, I'm certainly a better mother, but I'm also a better philosopher and I'm a better ethicist because I have been forced, encouraged <clears throat> to think about these kinds of issues that I had to grapple with them, which is not to preach to you all, but it is an expression of my authentic reality. Now, lest you think this sounds all like pie in the sky, right now I can hear my 13-year-old African-American son in his man cave downstairs screaming at his Call of Duty video game, right? So, and the dog is outside the store going, hey, why am I not on this call? I want to be on this call, right? So just to kind of break the third wall, um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the reality. But in my dining room, um, we could, I'm putting up, someone's asking for the last slide. Um, in my dining room, we can still have these discussions, even though it's not gonna be perfect, even though it's gonna be messy, um, even though I might say things that are wrong, but I'll learn from them. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there, if, if that's all right, John, um, and, and have the rest of the time for questions. Absolutely, uh, Pauline, thank you uh, very much. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, we've got one interesting question here. And uh, do you see it there before you? I can scroll up. Um, identifying as Black, but 51% Scottish and West African ancestry. Then what the, we, if we all had our... Um... Yeah, so this is interesting, especially with the... Um, I know that a few Christmases ago, the... The, the DNA testing, the ancestry testing was super popular as like a gift to give your um, <clears throat> friends and colleagues and family members. And depending on, <clears throat> would, this, would your view change based on what you found out about yourself, right? Um, so if I found out that I'm 49%, let's say African-American, would that change how I view myself? I'm guessing for a lot of people it would. Um, so there's a sort of question of how people identify. Then there's a question of their um, sort of genetic makeup, but bear in mind that both race and gender are social constructions. Um, the Duchess of Sussex is, is biracial, right? Um, so, and is our, our, our vice president is multiracial, but there are certain ways in which we, we sort of think about, or they think about for themselves, how they're gonna identify. My 13 year old is <clears throat> African-American and Korean, um, but he identifies more as African-American. My oldest son is Latino, um, but if you saw him on the street, you might not know that because he has, he has fairly light skin and, and, and often, uh, as, as they say, passed. Um, and in fact, in legal circles, um, after, after slavery was ended, uh, you could sue in court to be considered white. Whiteness was a property, was something you could own, something you could claim, because along with whiteness came certain legal rights, right? So yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And I, I you know, I, I think some of this, some of it, I guess, is about hatred. I think some of, I think a lot of it is just, it's, it's about not wanting to acknowledge that there are, that you have free Wi-Fi and someone else is paying twice 
depends on what it is. Or am I not even be willing to acknowledge that I have free Wi-Fi? Well, that's just the way it is. Like everyone has free Wi-Fi, right? Well, no. Um, so then what happens when you start to learn about these strategic disadvantages? Um, it's easier to say, well, it's, well, they didn't work hard enough or, you know, their parents didn't save them. It's easier it's, it, we go the personal, only the personal responsibility route because that, that feels more comfortable. So, yeah, so super interesting question. Um, you know, would that change how we, how we view ourselves? The reality is the United States is becoming much more multicultural. Um, I taught my philosophy and race class for 10 years. When I started, I had very few students who came from multicultural families or were in multicultural relationships. When I ended, um, I would say at least half of my students had that experience and it changed the discussion. Um, because it was no longer black, black, white, Asian, Native American, whatever. Now, now we have much more complicated intersectional identities. And then that complicates things even even further. Um, yeah, so there's a, yeah, we got a question here from uh, from the general. What do you oh, think okay. is important to consider when measuring success for gender and racial diversity? It's not just about a number, but what is really success if you have a racially and gender balanced diverse organization? So the place I taught undergraduate at Pacific Lutheran University, which is in Tacoma, Washington, right next to um, Joint Base Fort, Fort Lewis. In fact, my living room overlooked the McCord uh, flight line. Um, and when I first started there, we had almost no students of color. And I remember saying to the director of admissions, you know, about the time that I was adopting my children. So I'd been at PLU for six or seven years. And I said, I would really like PLU to be a place that my, my children could come and feel welcomed and seen for who they are and feel comfortable. That's my metric. That's, and that's my um, vision. Um, sorry to break it to, to the Admiral in this context, but this is my vision for the Naval War College as well. My son wants to be, my youngest son wants to be a Marine. I would like the Naval War College to be someplace he could come be sent as a Marine and come here and get a good education and be seen and be valued and feel like he belong, truly belongs as a member of the community. So I tend to think that now I understand that's much more intangible and that's more difficult to measure, but I think that's more important than numbers. Do the members of the community feel as if they belong? Do they feel seen and heard for themselves, because different African Americans have different experiences. Different women have different experiences. Um, my experiences are very different than my colleague Alinda uh, Johnson, right? Um, even though we're both women, um, so so I think it's also about understanding the nuances and the differences between people's experiences, without using that as an excuse to say. Um, <clears throat> as the Duchess of Sussex has experienced. Um, as some of the clapback was, well, that's not really, that's not really, that's not a thing, right? Um, you're just being oversensitive, some of the comments out there, right? I think there's a reality to these experiences. I have never been profiled when I go to the store. My son is profiled nearly every single time he walks into a store. My interactions with the police are very different than his. He's never been in trouble with the police. He's never had a what what I would think of as a negative interaction with them. But his experience walking around in a black male, thirteen year old body is very different than my lived embodied experience as a fifty something um, white woman of Scottish descent. Right. So I think I think that is what what I would want us to move towards. But I understand <clears throat> in the military, we have to have, and in academia, we have to have metrics. We'd like to have metrics. But maybe we need to think about qualitative metrics. I don't want to get political, but uh, the prior administration uh, demanded that the Department of Defense cease any teaching about race and diversity. The new administration has changed that. What are your comments in that situation? Yeah, that was going to be an interesting test of academic freedom uh, because I teach critical race theory as part of 
what I do academically. So that could have been really um, interesting. First of all, I think there's a difference between, in that slide that I showed with all of those different words, there's a difference between critical race theory, critical legal theory, and anti-racist uh, trainings or movements. Those are different kinds of things. So first of all, I think there's a difference between education and training. I don't advocate for critical race theory in the classroom any more than I advocate for Kantian ethics. I actually don't like Kant. He's wrong about pretty much everything because I wrote my dissertation on David Hume, right? Um, who they're in, in violent opposition to one another. So I can teach something. I can represent someone's viewpoint without agreeing with, and I think it's important for our students to understand different viewpoints. So I can teach critical race theory. I can teach all kinds of different versions of feminist thought. And it doesn't mean I necessarily agree or disagree with them, but our students are better for encountering them. Um, now, some versions of certain kinds of training have a different kind of, it's a, it's a different kind of thing. Um, where what you're trying to get people to do is come to terms with racism. That's a different thing than what we do um, here in the classroom. I do think um, it is valuable to have conversations about race. And especially for those of us who are members of those privileged groups that get free Wi-Fi and that have been invited to the dinner party um, and have taken it for granted that everyone's invited to the dinner party. I do think that we have work to do thinking about those systems and those structures and how they've affected us and how they've affected other people and then what that means going forward. And I would say that all of these traditions, critical race, critical theory, um, anti-racist, there's a great deal of diversity within these movements and disagreement about how to move forward. It's, it's not the case that every anti-racist person is like, okay, um, here's the memo on our group ideas about how to, no, it's like any political movement, right? Um, there's disagreements about things. So, so I guess for what we do, I think of it more in education. I think it'll be an interesting question for the Department of Defense, what kind of trainings. I know we have our extremism stand down here soon and I'm participating, I've been asked to participate. <clears throat> In, in some other ones as a guest speaker. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how different people in, engage these kinds of things and what kind of training the Department of Defense wants people to do in the future. In general, I think clicking through PowerPoint slides is um, probably not the way one should engage um, racial and uh, gender equity um, training or education, but that is my bias. So you can like put bias under my picture and flash in my that's because I'm a philosopher. I think we should have conversations. Pauline, uh, if we have had generations, decades, centuries of inequity, how do you address that without being charged with reverse discrimination? And I know there have been cases throughout uh, uh, academia that says, I have been mistreated because I happen to be white and male. How do you address those issues and how do you correct the problem without some kind of a uh, process that allows the uh, correction to be made? Yeah, that's, that's a really important question. I guess um, I'll give you all a little homework, um, which is to dial up Chris Rocks. I think it was, I wanna say 2004, 2006, uh, he has a routine that he did on affirmative action. It's on YouTube. Just go YouTube it and watch it. Because what he does is he articulates the nature of the problem really well, which is that if you are in a, a disadvantaged group, that means that you had certain structural disadvantages um, and someone else has a head start over you. Essentially. So he compares with having a 400 year, you know, I have a 100, 400 year head start over um, Chris Rock, let's say. Um, so the first question is, is what are the disadvantages and what does correction look like? Um, I, 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 I'm, the, the notion of reverse discrimination seems, uh, that's something I'd want to unpack and think about a little bit. Um, because discrimination is usually a systemic kind of thing, 
right? So if we're going to claim reverse discrimination, we have to claim that there is some kind of systemic, systematic um, discrimination now that is happening, let's say against me because I'm a white woman, right? Um, but I do think we, we have to have conversations about what the end state looks like and also understand. So let's go back to the free Wi-Fi. What should we do? Should, you st should I have to start paying for Wi-Fi? I'm gonna think that's unfair. Why should I pay for Wi-Fi? I've never had to pay for Wi-Fi, that's unfair. Right, you're discriminating against me because I haven't had to pay for Wi-Fi, right? So the, the question there is, is to think about that analogy, maybe what would be equitable? Everyone gets free Wi-Fi. Okay, well, that's not really economically sustainable, right? Up to this point, some people have been subsidizing other people's free Wi-Fi, right? So what do you, should they get their money back? They've had to pay twice as much. Um, should they get their money back? Should the people who have had Wi-Fi have to pay the people who are being, being paid twice as much? This is called reparations, right? Which is one, uh, considered one solution, right? Um, so, so I think the question, I mean, it's a really tricky question. And, and the question is, you can't just start where we are and say, well, forget about the past. Um, that was then, this is now, and you even though you are, um, we're at this point in the race and even though you're like six laps behind because I got a head start, we're just gonna start here and run the race. I think we can see that there's a problem with that, right? So then the question becomes, how, how do we think about what, what equity looks like? Um, and in order to have equity, like what does that mean both for the group that's had a, an advantage, but also the group that's had a disadvantage, right? Um, it seems like uh, that there has to be some kind of compensation or some kind of adjustment made. Now the question of course is what does that look like? One take on that is affirmative action, but that's only that's only one approach. Reparations are another way to think about it. Um, and in terms of, you know, I think we are capable of a lot of innovative, creative thought. Um, I think this is one area where we need some innovative and creative thought to think about what, what would correcting these inequities look like. If for generations, African-Americans or women were barred from holding property, they're going to be at an economic disadvantage. What do you do about that? Right? There is an intergenerational wealth. So Prince Harry could do what he did, move to California because his mother left him money. Right, Without that intergenerational wealth, he wouldn't have had the ability to do um, what he wanted to do and what he needed to do. So if we think about that and how that reverberates through society, um, I think that we, we need to start to think about then what would adjusting or acknowledging these inequities um, look like? I think the first step is acknowledging that they exist. For some people, they're not even willing to go there, right? Um, but then once we acknowledge it, okay, I say uh, to my son, yes, I've had free Wi-Fi all my, all my life. Now, what does that mean for our relationship? or I have white privilege, I'm not profiled in the store like you are. What does that mean for, for our relationship? Um, so that was a really unsatisfactory answer. I'm sorry about that. That was absolutely fine. There are no easy answers. <laughs> uh, we're getting towards the end of our uh, period here, but there's a question that uh, uh, says that the military always tries to measure inclusion as a measure of how we're doing. Can mm -hmm. you talk about some measures of inclusion that could be used? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would go back to what I said before is, you know, I mean, you could do, I mean, you could ask people, like, do you, do you feel like your concerns are taken seriously? Do you think like you are heard and seen in your, in, in your, all of your identities? Um, are your identities affirmed? Um, or are they denigrated? So I think there's questions we could ask about how we treat one another. Um, and whether or not we feel like we are full members of, of the, uh, of whatever community that we're in. Um, and I don't think inclusion always means that we're completely comfortable 
Um, I think it is that I, so when I encounter other people across the Navy War College, so when I run into my colleague, Tom Nichols or, or Dave Burbeck, they're like, hey, how's it going, philosopher? Like they acknowledge that I'm a philosopher and like they think sometimes things I say are weird, maybe, um, but they, they acknowledge that piece of my identity, right? I feel seen and heard as a philosopher as a woman who wears an excessive amount of leopard print, right? So I feel like my identities are, are, are affirmed, right? Um, if you don't feel included, then you will feel marginalized or harmed or left out for your identity. So that might be one place that we could, that, that we could start. Um, it's because I think you feel included if you think you're heard and you think you're seen for, who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, so that might be a start. I don't know how you orient survey questions around that because I'm a philosopher. So uh, that's not my, the social sciences can tell you how to do that. Thank you, really good questions. I know there were much more in chat than could be accommodated. So thank you for your, for your good thinking. Absolutely, and Pauline, thank you very much for uh, teeing up a lot of uh, issues that we need to be considered. I know the Secretary of Defense is uh, very, very interested in what's going on across the DOD enterprise with regards to diversity, racial equality, uh, and extremism, all of these issues that uh, we need to, to wrestle with. So uh, any last comments you'd like to leave with us before we uh, uh, secure for the day? I would just say to hopefully this has maybe opened up a way to start to have some conversations. And I understand those conversations are, are uncomfortable. So I'll just end with a story about my son. Um, when George Floyd happened, he came downstairs and he had his um, smartphone in his hand. And he said, do you know who George Floyd is? And I said, yeah. And then I said, did you see the video? And he said, yeah, I saw the video. And he looked at me and he said, you realize mom that they're going to kill me one day too, right? And I said, no. He's like, yeah, mom. And so that was a really like slam my face into the brick wall, right? I'm someone who teaches and thinks about this. And I had to sit down and then have a conversation, a very difficult conversation with my son about that and what it meant. And I couldn't just say to him as a mother, oh, baby, that's not what's going to happen because I would have been lying to him, right? And not honoring his lived embodied experience as an African-American male. Um, so I guess I would just hope, and I know that's kind of a bummer to end on. But I just hope that 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 will um, that the conversation we've had today will help you maybe overcome some discomfort to try to try on someone else's shoes and to start to have these conversations because I think it's in these conversations that we can we can have some progress. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Did you have anything you'd like to say before we uh, take a break before our family discussion group? Yeah. First of all. Um... Uh, Dr. Shanks Curran, I want to thank you for your presentation today. Uh, this is such a difficult topic and one that, uh, that I know that leaders in our military are struggling with. Uh, leaders across America are struggling with. Uh, citizens across America are struggling with. And uh, we are, uh, frankly, um, this conversation that we're having in America is also being taken up in other countries. Uh, finding a way to sit in the same room and hear uh, another person's point of view on this topic uh, is so essential to first understanding and then uh, having a very deep dialogue about uh, what can be done. And so uh, thank you for bringing that to our seminar series. And uh, I just appreciate your, your courage to address this uh, in our forum. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral, appreciate that.